to introduce our speaker this evening, um, Dr. Gabriel A. Bowen, professor at the University of Utah. He has a um, master's from the University of Michigan with the highest honors in geological sciences, PhD from the University of California, Santa Cruz. He, um, after getting his degrees, uh, has spent six and a half years at Purdue as an associate professor. And since then, he's been at the University of, of Utah. Um, professor of Geology and Geophysics is also the co-director of the Stable Isotope Facility for environment, Environmental Research. His research interests in particular are isotope geochemistry, paleoclimate, carbon cycle, water cycle, and forensic ecology. He's not going to talk about that tonight. If you want to catch him later and ask him what forensic ecology is all about, feel free. He's a member of the GSA, American Geophysical Union, amongst uh, other organizations. He has over 100 journal publications, and he's been involved with or published over a dozen uh, books. His list of presentations uh, given at conferences and seminars around the US and around the world is every bit as impressive as his list of publications. He has a long list of postdoc and graduate students uh, that he has and or is uh, taken care of right now. And on his free time, he, of course, teaches multiple courses at the university. So without further ado, I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming Gabe Bowen. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's, it's really awesome to be here. I have to say I'm super impressed uh, watching the slide reel. Uh, all of the geology or science stuff that's going on here in this group uh, brings to the community. Um, it's almost enough to make me want to move up here. <laughs> I'm not sure what I, where I work. Um, anyway, I, uh, I also want to just thank John and Sue for uh, putting me up while I'm here. Uh, it's great to be able to come in and have some, some friends in the community immediately uh, as soon as you arrive. So thank you. OK, I'm going to talk today about uh, climate change, environmental change. Um, but using the geologic record as a, as a key to understanding it. And uh, for starters, what I want to do is ask, I don't know if any of you are betting men or women, but I want you to think for a second about a sure bet. What's a sure bet? Right? If you were going to put your, something, your money on something that you were absolutely sure would happen, climate change. Okay. That's a good one. Yeah. Change is, change is, right, uh, is, is inevitable. So that's something that we can all bet on, I think. That's inevitable. Getting more, a little more specific though, if I had to put my money on a number, if I had to put my money on a specific change, I think it would be this. It would be that next year the CO2 levels in our atmosphere are going to be higher than they were this year. Right? This is the famous Keeling curve, which has shown us since uh, 1958 when they started gathering these data in Mauna Loa, Hawaii. The continuous growth of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Right? We understand this. We know what's driving it. It's burning fossil fuels, it's deforestation to some degree. And this curve and these observations have taught us a lot about how the Earth works, about how its biogeochemical cycles work, and it's got obvious links um, that uh, scientists have explored to great length to the climate system and what we might uh, anticipate our climate will look like in the future. So carbon today, carbon cycle's changing, it's important. Uh, we learn a lot from these kinds of observations. And if we look at the geologic record, uh, folks who think about Earth history have been thinking about carbon and the carbon cycle on Earth in many different ways for a long time as well. And so we've got uh, models like this one by Bob Berner showing the cycling of carbon between rocks and the atmosphere and the oceans. Okay. And we can see how those play out and uh, what we, what we think happened with CO2 concentrations in the carbon cycle in the past. And there's all kinds of interesting stuff that our scientists look at, from the faint young sun paradox, potentially carbon compounds keeping the Earth warm uh, when the sun was 20% dimmer uh, early in Earth's history, uh, to what we see here, which is the rise of land plants and uh, the growth in atmospheric O2 and, and a reduction in CO2, right? change in the carbon cycle plants burying more carbon across. So there's lots of interesting things to look at here. But there's a big difference between the slide I showed you at the beginning and this one, that's time scale. Okay. The one at the beginning was 50 years of record. 
and 60 years of record now. We can't even see that, begin to see that on this uh, 500 million year curve. And the one that we see here is really fascinating to geologists and earth scientists, but uh, it means pretty much jack all with respect to your average person right here on Earth. The human time scale is invisible in here. So uh, there's a disjunct, uh, disjoint between these processes that are playing out here and the ones that we're interested in in terms of predicting our future. So there's middle ground, though. And what I want to talk about today is this middle ground. And that is. This is another kind of depiction of what we're doing here today, potentially burning all of the fossil fuels that we've got in the crust, or some fraction thereof. Depending on how much we burn, that's going to influence how much CO2 levels in the atmosphere go up. But what we often don't think about is the long tail of this, of the carbon cycle. And so we think about the next you know, few hundred years, potentially, or the next decade, maybe our kids, kids' kids, grandkids. But this CO2 is going to be around and with us for a very long time, tens to hundreds of thousands of years. And so this intermediate time scale, what we're really talking about is how what we put into the atmosphere, even after we stop burning, cycles through the natural earth system. Right? And the effects that it has and the feedbacks that either keep it there or pull it out. Right? And that's what's going to govern climate change on Earth uh, really for the next 10,000 years plus. And here we have potential to use the geologic record to look at these processes. And so again, what I said was feedbacks are important here. What I showed you on the previous slide was a model of us putting CO2 in the atmosphere and then what happens afterwards. And what happens afterwards after we stop burning CO2 or burning carbon, uh, burning fossil fuels, is, uh, is feedbacks. Right? It's the natural system picking up, taking over, redistributing that carbon into and what we're looking at here is the uncertainty in these feedbacks. So these are the oceans here. This is the terrestrial uh, ecosystems, soils, and plants. What we're looking at is various different sophisticated Earth system models that scientists use to predict feedbacks in the carbon cycle, to predict what's going to happen going forward, even now just over the next 100 years. And you can see there's some variability in how much CO2 the oceans are going to take up. A positive number means that, this, that the oceans are helping us, They're taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and sequestering it, dissolved carbon in the oceans. You can see over here for the terrestrial ecosystems, the spread is huge. Right? Some of these models, these are the best models that scientists are using today. Some of them predict a massive uptake as forests go and soils swell with carbon. Others predict an almost equally massive release, uh, positive feedback as climate warms and soils release carbon to the atmosphere. And I don't know if you know, does anybody know how much carbon, how many petagrams of carbon, billions of tons of carbon a year, you know how much we're releasing through fossil fuel burning right now? It's about 10 per year. Okay. So these are not small numbers. This is like you know, potentially doubling almost the release of CO2 to the atmosphere. Uh, under a scenario where we have this kind of uh, positive feedback in terrestrial systems. So it's important to understand this. We have a lot of uncertainty. We can look at what's happening today with something like the Keeling curve, and we can learn a lot from it. But if we want to be able to identify which processes are important, when we start thinking about feedbacks, the geologic record has potential. Right? So that's what we're going to talk about today. Of course, the problem is when we look at the geologic record and try to think about this, we've got uh, blurry glasses on here. We don't have much focus. Right? Trying to pick out changes on the time scale of thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of years is tricky. And if we're asking, you know, is this forest getting greener or browner, uh, there's an element of subtlety there where we're only going to be able to see that and see it with a resolution that's useful in certain specific uh, kind of opportune cases. So uh, I'm going to argue today that one of the cases which uh, might actually be productive, we might actually be able to go to the geologic record and see these processes play out and learn from them, about them, is the paleocene eocene thermal energy. So this is a you now fairly famous climate kind of history roadmap to the climate history of the last 65 million years. Dinosaurs go kaput right about here. And the Earth's climate system evolves through 
various trends and fluctuations. We have very warm conditions here in the early part of the Cenozoic. We collapse, the climate system collapses into uh, glaciation here 33 million years ago. Okay, and ever since then, we've had ice on Antarctica. And then today, we sit over here in this uh, global ice house climate state where we've got our glacial interglacial cycles. The event I'm going to talk about happens during this warm interval here, but it's different than these long-term trends. You can kind of pick it out here as a blip in these oxygen isotope records. It's all about ocean temperature. Okay. It's a big positive blip in temperatures. It's a spike in temperatures. And scientists have focused in on this event because we know now, I'll show you evidence in a minute, that it was driven by release of carbon in the atmosphere. The CO2 levels in the atmosphere went up. Temperatures changed. Ecology changed, the oceans changed. Okay? All of these things that we're seeing today and expecting for the future happened here. And there's and they happened on time scales that are broadly comparable to what's happening today. So there's potential to look at this event as an analog or at least a, uh, an episode that we can learn from in thinking about the future. And so what happened during the uh, Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum? Well, CO2 levels went up. There was an abrupt increase in atmospheric CO2. It's really hard to get precise estimates of CO2 from the distant geologic past, but there's various ways of doing it. And the data that we have suggests that we went from CO2 levels of about 600 to 700 parts per million in the atmosphere. Today we're at 400. Okay. And we jumped up to potentially about 1,500. Okay. So roughly a doubling to tripling of CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. And if I didn't point it out on those curves I showed earlier, but that's easily something that we could experience, likely will experience in the future. Um, where did this carbon come from? Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but it's a really interesting question. Obviously, there were no people uh, on Earth 55 million years ago burning fossil fuels and putting CO2 in the atmosphere. So this is a situation where we have a natural release of carbon in the atmosphere. And some of the really important evidence here comes from isotopes, carbon isotopes. And so this event was actually initially documented and identified by paleo-oceanographers studying sediment cores from the ocean basins of the world. And they were measuring carbon isotopes to try to stratigraphically correlate between cores. What they found was at the time just a single sample, well, let's say it's that one, right, that fell way away from the rest of the samples in their core. And those would be over here. They thought it was an anomaly. They wrote it off. They said, oh, somebody grad student screwed up the mass spectrometer and made a bad measurement. But then they looked at it more closely, and it happened to coincide exactly the same stratigraphic level with the benthic extinction that they were also studying. So then they started to think, huh, all right. They went back. They made some more measurements. And what we know now today is this is actually a coherent worldwide shift and the isotope ratios of carbon. We see it in the oceans. These are three records at three sites that I've been involved with where we see it in the continents. You can see it recorded in continental environments. So we know that this is a global worldwide shift in carbon isotopes. Okay? Everywhere that we see carbon actively somewhere. How do we feel about isotopes? <laughs> well, love them? Okay, I do, obviously. But, uh, right, so, you don't need to know too much about isotopes here, except that isotopes, uh, we're measuring carbon, it's the same element, right? Different atoms in the same element with slightly different weight, slightly different mass, okay? And they can tell us a lot, but in this case, what they're telling us is that there's a release of organic carbon to the ocean atmosphere system. I think, yep, that's this slide here. So we can go around the world today, we can measure the carbon isotopes, which are usually these negative numbers, which is confusing, but just this is heavier, this is lighter, this is higher, this is lower. And we can measure a bunch of stuff, and what you see is that organic materials tend to be down here at the low end, and inorganic materials tend to be up here. So carbonate rocks are up here, ocean carbonate, DIC is up here, shells are up there. But when we get into uh, stuff that's derived from plants, okay, or biogenic processes, uh, formation of methane, and things like that, we have low numbers. So when we see a big shift, like we saw on that previous slide here, a big negative shift in carbon isotopes. It's happening worldwide. What this is telling us is that 
organic carbon got put into the atmosphere, put into the oceans, okay? mixes between the atmosphere and the oceans and soils and plants. But we have a net input of organic carbon from the crust. So this is actually, again, very familiar because I showed you a different plot of this upper curve here previously. This is the Keeling curve again, the CO2 concentrations. What many people don't realize is that Charles Keeling also started measuring a little bit later on carbon isotope ratios of atmospheric CO2. So if you look at what's happening with CO2 in the atmosphere today, it's a negative carbon isotope excursion. Fossil fuels are organic carbon, right? They're organic use of carbon. We're burning them, we're putting them into the atmosphere, and not only is CO2 going up, but carbon isotope ratios of CO2 are changing at the same time in lockstep. And this is what we see here in the ATM. Okay? We have CO2 concentrations going up, we have a big drop in the carbon isotope ratios. Okay? It's a smoking gun for release of organic carbon from the crust. And this may have been methane that came out of seafloor sediments where it was frozen. It may have been massive volcanic complexes in the North Atlantic that were cracking organic material there and producing thermogenic methane that went into the atmosphere. We don't know. Right? I'm not going to talk about it more because we don't know, but we're very interested in trying to figure out how this happened. But what I want to talk about is the feedback. So when the CO2 gets into the atmosphere, what we see is a whole cascade of things changing. And folks have been working on this now for almost 30 years. We've got a, a good, good information in many components of the Earth system. Uh, about the impacts of this CO2 release during the peak. So some of the things that we see. Ocean acidification. Uh, this is one of the impacts that people are very concerned about with the release of CO2 today. The ocean, that the CO2 dissolves in the oceans, as I pointed out, it's going to be a boon to us. It's going to diminish the climate change impacts. But it's not good for things in the ocean that don't like acidity, right? like corals, because the CO2, when it dissolves in the ocean, makes a weak acid. We see warming. Uh, we see during the PETM that global temperatures, depending on where you go, the temperatures increase by between 5 and maybe 10 or 12 degrees C. So pretty substantial increases in temperature worldwide, amplified in places like the Arctic Ocean, uh, where it got really quite warm uh, during this event. We see evidence for hydrologic change. I'll show you more of that as we go on, so I won't talk about it here. Uh, we see evidence for plant and mammal migration. Some of my early work in my PhD was looking at this event and how uh, our ancestral mammals, including uh, the first primates that we see in the fossil record, migrated between continents during this event, probably because warming let them move, climate warming let them move northward and spread across land bridges. So we see all kinds of impacts in these events. But one thing that's really interesting and which uh, has framed my thinking about the feedbacks is that we see that the impacts of this event we're really prolonged. What I mean by that is we come back to some early modeling. This is similar to the model that I showed you before um, by my colleague Jerry Dickens. He was thinking about the PETM and trying to explain it, and explain in particular the carbon isotope records. So here's some of the early carbon isotope records over here. And if you dump a bunch of organic carbon into the atmosphere, you oxidize it, you make CO2, and you put it in the atmosphere, or you put it in the oceans, you let it mix around. If you put it in as a pulse like this, what you see is it changes the carbon isotope ratios, the ocean and the atmosphere. There's three ocean basins shown here in this model. And as soon as you turn it off, the natural system starts to recover. Right? Earth is full of Earth's biogeochemical cycles, and climate system and geological systems are full of buffers. They don't like to change. They like to try to keep the status quo. And so when we push them out of whack, and we remove the forcing, the input of carbon, and they relax back to where they like to be. And so this is kind of the classic model for how this event might have worked. You had a big release of carbon, it changed the system, and then natural processes, uh, rock weathering, for example, started to strip the extra carbon out. And that's what's shown there. But as we were generating more and more of these records of the PETM, what we saw is that the carbon isotopes, for example, don't actually follow that pattern. They do show an abrupt decrease. These are you know, some ocean records and some land records here. You can see there shifts by a different amount, but this pattern is the same. They've got a sharp drop, and then they've got a sharp recovery at the end. But in between, there's about 100,000 years, up to 150,000 years, depending on the age model we use, where things don't recover the way we expect them. 
So we push the system out of whack. We add carbon to the system. It responds. It changes. But then it doesn't rebound. It doesn't recover as quickly as we expect. And so this, to me, points at feedback. It suggests that when we push it in one direction, there's some processes that take over that keep it there and keep it from recovering as quickly as we might expect. So in terms of feedbacks, what I really want to talk about today is terrestrial feedbacks. What's happening on the planet? Again, this is one of the places where we have the biggest uncertainties for the future. We don't know how much vegetation and soils is going to change its carbon storage and how that's going to impact the climate system going forward. The PETM, if we have an example in the geologic record where climate warming, particularly carbon-driven climate warming, might have caused these kinds of changes, this is going to be it. And so I want to look at the PETM, and I want to look at some of the beautiful rocks that were deposited during these events in places like Wyoming, from Wyoming, um, and ask, do we see evidence for these terrestrial feedbacks? Right? Do we see changes in the amount of carbon stored in these systems? What do they look like? Do they amplify the change? Do they stabilize the system? And uh, what might have been causing this? And for the PETM, uh, we have two things we're going to think about here. One is organic carbon. And so this is a map for today. Um, carbon storage in soils and vegetation communities is large. There's a bunch of it. Not as much as potentially all the fossil fuels we might burn, but around 3,000 petagrams or billion tons of carbon. There's a lot of it. There's certainly enough that if it changed uh, by 20 to 50 percent, uh, it could take up most of what we're what we're doing in terms of emissions. So it's an important thing, right? It's an important piece of the system. And it's potentially a, uh, something that could change dramatically. Back during the Eocene, or the Paleocene, during this event, uh, we think probably the biosphere was even bigger. Right? And I showed you as background, the background climate conditions were fairly warm. And as a result, we have no ice on Antarctica. We have vegetated Antarctica. We have probably parts of the tropics that might have sustained a, a more vibrant biosphere even than that. So soils and plants are a big piece of the carbon cycle today. They're probably even bigger in the past. So asking a question about how they changed, uh, they could have been a big uh, influence on the system. The other thing I want to talk about is a little more uh, niche and less thought about, but there's a bunch of carbonate carbon, right? mineral carbon, limestone, on uh, formed in continental environments too. Some of this is in lake basins. The stuff I like to study, we'll see some lake basins that I study later on too, but uh, these are, oops, these are pedagogic carbonates. These are nodules of carbonate uh, limestone that form in soils around the world in many places. And they're particularly useful for us because we've got great, beautiful geochemical records from them and you know, make isotopic interpretations of the past. Uh, but also, they store carbon. Right? They have carbon locked into them. And so if they're changing their abundance and their volume, then they could be an influence on carbon cycle as well. So we're going to look at how these two different pools of carbon might have changed. And uh, the kind of majority of the data I'm going to show you here comes from uh, the beautiful Bighorn Basin in uh, northern Wyoming. This is a uh, Polecat Bench, which is one of the sites where this event, the Paleo's EDC Thermal Maximum, is probably the most studied. There are holes, and pits, and ditches dug all across this thing. Um, and for good reason. Uh, what we're looking at here is a stack of paleosols, fossil soils. Each of these colorful bands is a subsurface horizon of a soil, an ancient soil. We're in a Laramide Basin here that was generating accommodation space at this time. This mountains rose up around it. Sediment was washing in through streams and overnight floods. And as that happened, there were periods of quiescence, periods of stability when soils would form across the landscape, and then a new flood or set of floods would bury them. So we have a stacked record here of time in uh, a fairly rapidly degrading, accumulating terrestrial sedimentary system. And these soils are great because the soil, by definition, mixes uh, rock material <coughs> with atmospheric processes and climate influence and the vegetation that's living there on the soil. So we can get, we know what to look for in these soils. We can gain information on all those different things and how they're changing through the soil. And it just happens that uh, at this site, the Paleocene thermal maximum starts right down around here, where we start to get these first big red beds, uh, red paleosols, 
and it comes right up through to about this level here, and then it starts recovering. So uh, we will look at some data here from the Moon Base. And folks have been working on this for a long time, um, and there's lots of information that's been garnered on the PUTM. Uh, I won't talk about the mammal piece. It's really interesting. Not migration, but also dwarfing. Mammals get smaller. We'll talk about that later if we can. Um, but other things are happening in the environment as well. We can look at these paleosols and see burrows, and you can see this red coloration, which is really typical, these deep red soils during the PETM. Um, and these deep red soils are telling us that the soils are pretty well drained. They're different than the soils below or above. Uh, they're probably indicating at least seasonally dry conditions at this site during this time. So there's a change in the hydroclimate. That's also backed up by changes in the plant fossils. These little leaves, these are little leaves of legumes or something similar to legumes, and they become the dominant type of plant fossil. My colleague Scott Wing uh, has been collecting this basin for about 40 years, and these are anomalous. Right? Throughout uh, thousands of meters of section, the place where you see them is here during the PUTM, right? probably representing both migration of plant communities from south uh, but also adaptation to somewhat drier environments at the time. And we also see abundant paleosol carbonate in here. We see some other characteristics. We'll talk about that as we go on. So the data that I want to show you now come from a pretty um, unique and awesome opportunity we had. A group of us came together to get support from the National Science Foundation to core these outcrops. You might say, I showed you those beautiful pictures of outcrops, right? Why would you go and poke a hole in here? Why do you need a core if you can go up and access it 3D in the outcrop? And there's a number of reasons. One is uh, just continuity of record. Right? Anytime we're working with outcrops, you have to piece things together um, from one spot to the next. So here we can get a single kind of integrated and continuous record in the core. Another thing that we hadn't fully appreciated is weathering. So one of the first things we saw when we pulled these cores out and started to look at them was that the visible weathering zone right, in these soils goes down 10 to 15 meters. So we had been out there working in the field for decades doing geochemistry and the like. Right? We'd go out and we'd dig a trench, get down, like, you know, spend all day to get 50 centimeters below the surface where the rock was really hard. And we thought we were doing great. We had perfect fresh samples. And we go and drill these cores, and you can see that um, Pyrite is oxidized in these cores down to 15 meters. And so this allows us to get fresh samples um, in a way that we haven't been able to in the field before. And then the other thing that we can do, and you kind of see it here, this is a beautiful red paleosol. Uh, uh, you can see these nodules. These are carbonate nodules. And so it allowed us to get in there and sample these uh, pedogenic carbonate nodules in a resolution we haven't been able to before in a way that's hard to sample. So this is Scott, who I mentioned before, very proud of holding the first core to come up with our studies. So what does this tell us about feedbacks? This is just one basin. But if we look at it, what we see is at two different sites where we drill, basin substation here and the polecat bench that I showed you. We're looking first here at organic carbon, organic carbon preservation. These are, again, soil horizons that have been buried. We can go on and we can find organic carbon that demonstrably was paleocene and organic carbon being buried in these caves, in, the, in these soils. Um, and the amount, everywhere we've looked in the Big Horn Basin, drops precipitously during the PETM. One of the other goals of these cores was to allow our colleagues who are organic geochemists to come in and get good samples, right? Because again, they were worried about surface contamination and weathering. And, uh, I guess, unfortunately, the organic component of this project was pretty much a bust because there's no organic carbon in the PETM sediments, PETM full soils. So we see a big drop uh, at both sites here during the PETM in the amount of organic carbon preserved. Less carbon in the soils, less carbon being buried in the rocks. The soils. Even beyond that, when we do go in and we look closely at these materials, this is uh, work that my former PhD student, Clement Bataille, did, uh, doing um, organic petrography on these. So we would actually isolate the organic material from these fossil soils. We'd look at it in a microscope and characterize it. And what he found is that, particularly within this PETM interval, 
There's very little organic carbon, but what's there is rock-derived keratin. It's old, cooked, Cretaceous organic carbon. So basically, we have no new soil carbon that's being buried in, these basin, in this basin during the PDTM. Right? Things seem to have gone dead. There are plants there, but whatever carbon is making into the soils is being oxidized, okay? whether it's due to warmer temperatures or drier conditions, what have you. And all that ends up getting buried is this old stuff that weathers up and not so it's redeposited in the soil. All right, so why might this be? I mentioned it already. There's a variety of things. It could be driving this drop in the amount of carbon. These are a bunch of wiggles, but just to point out, red is drier. We see really red soils here. Uh, Yellow-brown nodules in these paleosols, they're guthite, iron hydroxide, iron oxyhydroxide, they form in wetter conditions. So if we look in the PETM, again, we see evidence for drying. And this may be seasonal drying, there's evidence further south in Colorado that we had intense storminess, maybe during part of the year. But we have a dry season, a hot season, and in places like this, uh, which have a really pronounced seasonal dry season, you end up with organic poor soils. Okay? And so this is maybe not surprising that we're seeing this. Let's look at the other side of things, these carbonate nodules. And so again, when we're, you know, with these cores, we're able to go in and we're able to look basically at every centimeter, right? Down 100 meters of core, spanning this event. We're able to look and see, uh, in a representative way, how much carbonate is there in these cores. Here's just some examples of the beautiful carbonate nodules we see in cross-section of these cores. Fascinating. There's lots of stuff to do with these. But what we did for the first time with these cores is we were able to go in and actually count, right, do an inventory. So we looked at the number of carbonate nodules, the size of the carbonate nodules. That's shown here. During the PETM, we see maybe a slight increase in the number of carbonate nodules. There's a lot of variability right, per unit depth. Uh, one horizon here has a whole bunch of them, kind of little. But we see much larger carbonate nodules than we see on average uh, above and below as well. How so, much time is involved in the shaded area? Uh, yeah, sure, thanks. So this isn't meters now, this is about 100,000 years in shaded area. Maybe 80,000. Yeah, so we see an increase in the carbonate carbon. The organic carbon goes down, but the carbonate carbon, the mineral carbon, goes up in these cores. And so there's a change in the type of carbon that's being buried, how it's being buried in these systems. And again, Carbonate carbon is something that forms in soils where we have a pronounced dry season usually. Uh, this is just a map of where you find carbonate horizons in soils today. And you can find them you know, generally worldwide, but in places where it's hot and dry part of the year. That's shown down. So again, probably a link to environmental conditions and changes in hydrology. And so what I've done here is try to summarize this. And so over here we're dividing this up into before the event. And then over here we've got after the event. And then we've got two different intervals in the middle here, the onset to kind of the, the bulk part of the event. And uh, I've added this up in two different ways, but basically uh, blue is organic carbon and red is the carbonate carbon. Point is that the amount of organic carbon being buried in these sediments, stored in these soils, is about half maximum about half during the PETM compared to what it was before and after. And the amount of carbonate carbon roughly doubles during the event, maybe a little bit more. So we've got this shift, this evidence for this shift, a feedback in these ecosystems. It's changing how carbon gets cycled through and picked up and stored in so. Okay, so this is one basin, but I think that as we're starting to look at more and more places worldwide, that this is a pattern that's much more general. That at least in the mid-latitudes where we have evidence, many, many places on Earth are experiencing this uh, seasonal drying, maybe an increase in the seasonality of precipitation, uh, and associated with that, a decline in the amount of organic carbon that's stored. And so there's evidence of various types for this. Uh, this is the not so glorious Powder River Basin, next door to the Big River Basin, not to Anybody here from Powder River Basin really love the Powder River Basin? <laughs> Not to the Poo Basin, but compared to the Big River. Um, anyway, <laughs> this is the PETM. If you've been to the Powder River Basin or know the geology there, it's famous for its coals, for the organic rich rocks that are there. This is the PETM. It's a bunch of red oxidized organic pore rocks. Okay? 
So just next door to the big barn, but again, we're seeing a similar thing in terms of change in the organic carbon storage. Uh, we also see evidence uh, in some places, this is a modern example, but a megafan deposit. Right? These things form in really intensely seasonal precipitation regimes. Right? Highly monsoonal, intensely seasonal precipitation regimes. And there's evidence in uh, northern Spain, for example, for the development of these kinds of sedimentary systems during the PETM. They weren't there before, they weren't there after, but the system is going haywire and the precip is arriving in buckets during a certain period. <coughs> One other place that I've been working is in central Utah, where we have a series of lake beds, mixed uh, siliciclastic and, and carbonate beds formed in a shallow lake system there. And uh, adjacent, we've got paleosol deposits where we've identified the carbon isotope excursion and correlated the PETM, so we know where the PETM is there. And if we try to match this up and correlate it throughout the lake system, what we see is that the PETM there coincides with a period of desiccation. The lake shrinks, we start to get uh, dolomite and even evaporite precipitation, and so we see a change in the hydroclimate there, and potentially also a change in the carbon storage uh, during that. And so we go from these you know, beautiful fossiliferous freshwater limestone facies here uh, to this kind of shaley material, and what you've got here is actually about a 10 meter thick bedded gypsum horizon formed in this lake. And uh, this is what it looks like up close. So dramatic changes in the hydroclimate that would have affected carbon storage in the soils. And then we've got direct evidence in a few other places as well. And so this is a little bit noisier, but the same general pattern. Here's our PETM interval correlated in with carbon isotopes. This is organic carbon content in these rocks. And what we see is during the PETM, we see a drop about half the organic carbon uh, or less uh, as we had before. OK, so we have to add it up piece by piece. But if we do that, if we try to extrapolate from where we have the observations, just simply ask the question, were these feedbacks in terrestrial ecosystems, right? the change in the amount of carbon that was stored and how the carbon was being stored in the soils, globally meaningful, we can come up with some numbers. This is a table with a bunch of numbers. Right? Point here is, ah, oh man, it's offset again. Well, let's take this number here. These are the estimated changes. If we take what we see in the Big Horn Basin, and we benchmark it against what we see in these other places. And we say, uh, try to extrapolate it up to a global scale. How much basin area is there worldwide that uh, would be depositing these kinds of materials? What's the percent change that we see in the Big Horn Basin? This is what we get. Organic carbon, basically, we have a drop during the PETM, globally, potentially, of about 1 times 10 to the 12 grams of carbon per year. So, a thousand, no, ten thousand billion grams of carbon per year. Okay, over here, this is what we see in carbonate carbon. It's about an order of magnitude less, but if the PETM, the Big Basin, is a model, maybe a subtle increase in the amount of carbonate carbon. So, which wins? Well, based on what we've seen so far, probably the organic carbon decline wins. And that means a positive feedback, amplifying feedback. Soils are storing less carbon. Terrestrial rocks are burying less organic carbon. And that means more CO2 left behind the ounce. And I want you to keep this number in mind here as we look at the next couple of slides. It's 1 times 10 to the 13. The decline in 1 times 10 to the 13 grams of carbon per year being stored globally or buried globally in soils. Because I want to compare that to results from some modeling that we've done. We've taken these simple computer models of the global carbon cycle, and we've applied them to try to ask what needs to happen to get the PETM to look like this. Coming back to the odd shape, the very long, prolonged nature of the PETM. What kinds of changes in the carbon cycle do we need to make this happen? And so the modeling results are over here. We force the model in order to reproduce the shape of this event by changing how organic carbon was being buried. And basically, in order to reproduce the general pattern that we see, we need to drop organic carbon burial worldwide by about 1 times 10 to the 13 grams of carbon. 
So I made both of these estimates. I, I'm not cheating, right? I'm not trying to like fiddle. And there's a huge uncertainty in both of these estimates. Massive. But to me, what I think we're seeing is that terrestrial ecosystems are changing during this event. They're likely changing in a way that causes them to store less carbon. And if we take the limited evidence that we have and scale it up, it looks like it is a plausible explanation for some of the strange nature and the prolonged nature of the Pileus and Eocene. We're warning them. So take home messages here. Um, the geologic record, I think, does offer us some clues on biogeochemical feedbacks that actually could be significant and important to humans in the coming centuries. Okay. There's all kinds of fascinating questions we ask of the geologic record and carbon cycling in the geologic record. Many of them have little impact on what we think our future is going to look like right, on a human time scale, but these do potentially. And it's one of the unique and few opportunities, I think, that we have to actually look at and see how these kinds of feedbacks really work, really work and play out in the Earth system where they actually happen. Uh, we see changes in uh, terrestrial carbon storage and burial during these events. Okay? And the main thing that we see here, the big change, the big dog, is the decline in organic carbon that's being stored. Right? The vegetation derived carbon stored in these soils is going down. And that's partially offset by an increase in the carbonate carbon in these sections that we've looked at in the Bighorn Basin. We're working on it, it remains to be seen, whether that's true elsewhere, and anecdotally, at least a few other places we see this. But it's a small change in comparison with the drop in organic carbon. It could be important for some reasons that I'm not going to get into, but it's a small change, and the big thing that's happening is organic material, organic preservation is going on. So the big question this raises in my mind is whether these feedbacks right, prolonged the BE10 and made it more severe than it would have been otherwise. Estimates of the climate sensitivity, the amount of warming that happened during the PETM for the amount of carbon that was released from rocks are kind of anomalously high compared to the climate models suggest. It seems like the change during the PETM was the climate change was more than we would have expected. This could be a part of that. Certainly it lasted longer than we would have expected. And this could be a part of that too. And if this is true, then it just basically doubles down on uh, the importance of understanding these feedbacks and these processes in the future. There's a lot of good work being done to understand them, but I think we can bring this kind of evidence from the geologic record, and it will help us uh, understand them even better. So with that, uh, there's a bunch of people who contributed to this work over there on the left. Uh, some sources of funding over on the right. A beautiful mural of what this might have looked like, probably not during the PETM, the Bighorn Basin, but more generally in background. And I understand that uh, you guys like to ask questions and talk about this stuff. So let's get to that part. Thank you. That'd be great. From a plant perspective, were there fewer plants or they were just disintegrating and spewing out the oxidizing and, and away they went again? That's a really good question and a really difficult one to answer. Um, all we have, well, basically all we have is the rocks that are left behind. Right? And so, um, Scott Bing, who I showed on that slide, uh, has been working in the Bighorn Basin since the early 70s. It's, it's his, and he's known about the PETM and been interested in, in it basically since the early 90s first discovered it. Right? Um, and it was his goal in life from the early 90s to find the flora of the PETM. And uh, it took him until 2004 to find it. Um, and he knew where to look. He was looking. The reason he couldn't find it is these organic rich rocks are gone. Right? Even the little localized um, lenses of carbonaceous shale and things where he would find the floras are gone. And so he eventually found a little, a small area in the basin where he could find these things. He, he found fossils. We know there are plants there, right? He's got fossil leaves. There's some pollen, although it's not terribly well preserved also. So we know there's some plants there. We can't really say from that what the standing 
you, you can take the types of plants that are there. This is not my business, so I won't go into it. But you can take the types of plants that are there, try to reconstruct the types of weeds you have, right? And try to reconstruct what the community might have looked like. And in this case, the reconstructions are much more depopulated, like going from a, a mixed woodland grassland ecosystem to something that's probably much lower canopy, um, probably much less vegetation overall. Um, but uh, we don't know. We can't take those fossils necessarily and go back to uh, how many individual plants were there, what was their total biomass. But is there some, since this was global, was there any, did you see, has there been any reports of the coral around the world at this particular interval diminishing in any way? This is the best data we have is from the Bighorn Basin at this point. There are a few other sites um, uh, that have pollen records and things like that. Uh, all of them see shifts, right? And the general sense is probably that many places the flora is declining. But again, kind of going to biomass or something is it's hard to do. Um, one of the interesting ideas that a, a colleague of mine at Purdue actually has advanced it got really hot in the tropic streams then. Um, sea surface temperature estimates are upwards of 40 degrees C, uh, which is, you don't see anywhere on Earth today. Um, and depending on what the air temperatures were that were associated with that, uh, we might have potentially reached an upper, a, a limit where plants basically couldn't survive anymore. Right? So enzymes start to break down, plants can't do their business anymore. So, uh, he's arguing the parts of the tropics we might have seen at uh, least temporary extirpation of all life or all vegetation in those areas. Uh, it's, he's a climate modeler, not a data guy, and uh, it's a convenient argue, argument for him to make because we've got very poor records from the tropics. We've got very few sites where you can go out and actually test this idea. The one place where it has been tested, uh, we do see evidence for plants still around, uh, so in Colombia. Uh, Matt argues that you're right at the ocean there, so it's a buffer environment. If you want to implement it, we wouldn't see it. But it's an interesting idea whether, you know, potentially during a event like this, we might have reached a kind of upper threshold for, for life on parts of the earth. Thank you. Yeah. Sure, isn't biomass by itself a feedback mechanism? Sorry? Isn't biomass by itself a feedback mechanism? Uh, it is and it can be. Um, it, uh, I avoided it here because for two reasons. One, we just talked about it's very, very hard to estimate. Uh, the other is that it's a much smaller component than the soil carbon. So standing biomass is uh, about, uh, uh, it's about a quarter of what's stored in soils worldwide today. So it's not to say it couldn't be significant, right? it couldn't have made an impact, um, but the larger kind of piece is stored in soils. The soils are also then, on these longer time scales of tens, hundreds, of thousands of years, they're the connection to the rock record, right? So vegetation is a transient pool of carbon. It can grow and shrink a little bit. But the amount of carbon that you bury in soils that go into the rock record, actually, that's, that's stored for the long term. And so it kind of operates in a little bit different way. That's good. Yeah. Well, with the ocean acidification and, and, and the reefs are die out, there's also less limestone uh, formation at that time. And would that be one of the factors that would prolong that curve? Yeah, um, yeah, great, great insight. Um, yes, so it could, can contribute a little bit. Um, the carbonate system in the ocean is a great buffer, right? So as we start to acidify the ocean, you dissolve limestone sediments, make less of them, right? And that balances, neutralizes the pH, yeah. Um, we see that happening here. So we see deep ocean, um, or, you know, we see, we see sites on the, um, out of the open ocean, right, where we have carbonate precipitation above the depth of carbonate precipitates and, and carbonate-rich sediments. Uh, and then during this event, they go barren. They go red like the rocks that I showed you. So all the limestones come. Um, so we've got pretty good records uh, of the ocean acidification itself. In terms of its impact on the carbon cycle and uh, kind of how prolonged that event is, uh, it actually should be a pretty quick turnaround, right? Because once you neutralize the ocean and you stop adding the extra carbon that's pushing it acidic, then you've got all these dissolved ions in the ocean and you pretty quickly start to recover. Um, 
to start uh, start precipitating even more carbonate than you did before. So the natural flushing mechanism, where by which the Earth gets rid of extra carbon over hundred of thousand year time scales, is ultimately burial and carbonate sediments in the ocean. Um, but uh, uh, and if that's happening here, we see that happening here. But I don't think you can explain the uh, kind of prolonged nature of the event just using that. That's built into these models that we run, and it doesn't, doesn't get you there. Yeah. Uh, Zarek, have you run across anything uh, that you think uh, would be or might be promising for sequestering the carbon? Could you repeat that question? Because I don't think everybody can hear it. Yeah. So, um, have we run into anything that might be useful in thinking about sequestering carbon in the future? Um, boy, uh, you know, one thing that has been interesting is seeing this change in limestone carbon. So, this is something that uh, folks are, are thinking about. Uh, some folks are thinking about today. Okay? So, there's ways you might be able to promote carbonate precipitation in soils, which um, could potentially store more. We see that happening here. Right? Um, I, I don't know if it's going to be a solution, but it's kind of a piece of bias thing, I think, to get rid of the carbon to, to mitigate the effects. So that's a potential piece. Uh, I guess the other thing that we see here is that you know we do see evidence over the longer time scale for the you know fairly strong influence of rock weather. Uh, and so again, that hundred thousand year kind of time scale of response for the system. Strips the extra carbon out is driven by rock weathering. Right? CO2 goes up, temperature goes up, you weather rocks faster on the continents. That delivers more dissolved ions to the ocean and it makes more carbonate rock. And that's where the carbon eventually goes. Right? And that seems to be happening. It's just, it seems to be delayed. And so a lot of the geoengineering or carbon sequestration mechanisms people are thinking about involve rock weathering, grinding up rocks and promoting silicate weathering. <coughs> I mean, it works, uh, but whether it's effective in terms of how much energy you have to put into that process of getting the rocks and grinding them up, uh, if you more fossil fuels to do that, it's not so great. Uh, and it also involves large areas of the land surface, right? You have to spread rock dust out over big areas. So it's got other kinds of things too. Tricky business, but I guess those are the two things that I can point to. Two of the graphs that you showed earlier, the one that showed CO2 concentration for the 60 year period. Can you go back to that and one that sure, yeah. ask you something about it? And one after that also that showed the So you're talking about this one here? Yeah. The annual cyclical period here is that due to temperature variation? That is one of the, so I teach a whole class on the carbon cycle. This is one of the things we focus on. This is just such a cool record. I mean, yeah, it's really, it really saves yeah. That's the biosphere breathing. Yeah. That's the northern hemisphere where we've got all of the land area, most of the land area on Earth, right? Most of the plant productivity. Uh, every northern hemisphere summer, plants suck some CO2 out of the atmosphere. Every northern hemisphere winter, they stop doing that, and the CO2 is kind of net put back in the atmosphere. Graph three or four after this that shows the projections of the CO2 out to the year 2010. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. Need, you you need want to just not buy? No. Go back. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's uh, it's got to be after this time. Yeah. Right. I think I know what you're talking about. Just before the dog with the glasses. Before <laughs> the dog with the glasses. Okay. Right. Right there. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Now, on this, you've got beyond today, you've got some pretty pronounced variations, annual variations. If you're projecting in the future, are you projecting that there will positively that there will be variations in the future? Well, sure. I know there's going to. We know there's going to be variations in the future. Whether these are the variations. Are these just screws and stuff that they were showing certainly or No, these are actually coming out of the models. So from, so from before today, yes. Oh, but you're modeling this. Yeah. These are models. Stuff. These are numerical models, right? So each model has its own variability that's inherent to the model. 
and not everybody is kind of sensitive. Uh, it is, but I think, I mean, if you look, right, there's no coherence. This one, uh, I don't know, I mean, this one goes up here. None of the others go up here, right? That's, again, stochasticity, like the models, processes take over, take them this way, and then they recover a little bit. So each model has its own set of properties that way. Yeah, the point here, I mean, don't put any stock in the little wiggles. Those don't necessarily mean anything other than telling you a little bit about the model's inherent variability. But the overall trend, right, and the yes. dispersion of the trends, uh, if you look at it, right, I mean, the difference between the different models, what they predict the ocean's going to do, or what the land is going to do, yeah. is huge compared to any given models. That's yeah. Yeah. The problem I have had is when you show this kind of variability in the future, it draws your eye to the variability, not the trend. Yeah. And the trend is what's important. Fair enough. The other two panels in this figure that I didn't show show that. Okay. Okay. I heard a comment uh, why the more uh, uncertainty in the land. Yeah, to oversimplify it, it's because the land is uh, more complicated. <laughs> uh, a lot of the response in the ocean is simple uh, physical chemistry, thermodynamics. Uh, you're dissolving carbon into ocean water, which is a not entirely, but to first order, a fairly simple physical process. Okay. Here, biology is the interface, right? So uh, it's all about plant productivity, microbial activity in soils, restoration of organic matter in soils, and there's a lot more uncertainty in our understanding of those processes and how it might change in response to, to climate. So, yeah, so how, how far back before the ETF do you have to go in the geologic record to find a similar temperature spike and does it have the duration? Yeah. Can we see that? Yeah, really good question. Uh, so, two answers. Uh, one is to ignore the back part for a second. Um, the PTM is actually, we recognize now, just one and the biggest of probably three or to five of these events that happened during the early part that you see. And so, there's another one that happens about two million years after the PTM, there's another one after that. Um, the PTM is the only one that has, they all have some quirks, but the shape that I showed you, the really prolonged nature, okay, this is the only one that has that. Interestingly, the next one that happens is kind of a couplet. It kind of, uh, there's an event, a warming, and it comes back, and then about 100,000 years later, there's another little warming. And so some have argued that in the PETM, what we saw is we just pushed the system far enough that it never recovered between those two warming peaks that happened. Um, anyway, uh, so there is some evidence that, you know, there's some other events like this that happen. They may, uh, they certainly were smaller in magnitude overall. And it, it may be that we didn't, like, cross the sh threshold and kick in these feedbacks this year from the same as others. If you want to go before this event, you have to go back to the Cretaceous. And the records we have there are a lot sparser, but there are several events that folks have argued are PETM-like, involved for release of carbon. There's a carbon isotope curation associated with them, things like that. And they, uh, I hesitate to say too much about them, because we don't have the same kind of globally correlated uh, records where we can truly say this is a global event and can point that it's a carbon and then the time scales are harder and so like that. So I, I don't think we've got good examples from the Cretaceous that can really directly compare this. Things seem to be happening when we don't want to I uh, skipped you. So. Okay, that's good. Um, the one thing that also intrigued me is that one of your picture grams is the shrinkage of, of land uh, during the period, which I guess you kind of expect that water levels are going to go up, therefore you're going to lose uh, your coastal areas. Uh, so my questions are twofold. If, if you shrink the land and you've got all this water surface area, I guess my question was, would you have more rain? Now you said it's maybe more, uh, maybe, maybe more storm related, which is the reason why there you showed those fans. So was there 
a significant shrinkage in length. We lose like 20% of the length mass. But <coughs> not, I'm just going to kill the rain. Not that much. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question because I mean, sea level is a piece of it, but uh, the geometry of the ocean basin is uh, slightly different. So. Uh, I actually don't know off the top of my head I can make something up, but um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't, I, mean, I think the total land area probably was not hugely different, but, you know, order of percents. Um, so the ocean basin, certainly there were more of the continental shelves flooded in the broader area of the continental shelves. And so probably some land area consumed because we didn't have the ice sheets at the poles and some of the sea levels. Um, but I, I don't think it's not a 20% change. Yeah. So, um, yeah. But then, so. because you have more surface area of, of water, yeah. you would expect more evaporation, which would create more well, water or rain. Yeah. But I, that may not. So that's a tricky one because the residence time of water in the atmosphere is really short. It's only about 10 days. You can increase evaporation all you want, but the atmosphere can only hold so much water, right? And uh, so it comes back out, and there's a pretty direct correlation between increased evaporation and increased precipitation. Um, and uh, most of that happens over the oceans. So, yeah, I mean, you might expect that if, you know, if on the whole the continents are a little bit smaller, you've got less distance to the coast, you can more effectively transport water into the environment, that kind of thing. And so I think you, you could make those kinds of arguments, um, but, in terms of what the data is showing, it's suggesting that at least, again, seasonally, we've got these dry uh, conditions. Uh, you know, there's a number of places now, we work in Big Bend National Park, there we see a change in the sedimentary regime during these events where we see sandstones, right? Um, we've got these soils and all of a sudden we see these sheet sands that come in. So um, there's definitely something going on with the water cycle and storminess. A lot of environments we see these uh, evidence for probably flashier discharge and moving the sediment through these systems. Um, but then at the same time we see you know, indicators of dry environments. And so I think what that's telling us is more intense seasonality, more intense seasonality. And as the continental interior is warm, as the world warms in general, we expect the continental interiors are going to warm faster than the oceans. And that promotes monsoons, basically. So that heating of the continental interiors uh, is what drives a lot of monsoon circulation. So it may be that we're just creating super monsoons on many of the continents at this time. Let's see. The Paleocene baseline leading up to the BTM was already a great deal warmer than what we know today. Yeah. What was carbon at that time? What was what? Sorry. What was the, the what was our level, our saturation in the atmosphere of carbon of CO2 at the then. same time? Yeah, um, I have to say it's a matter of debate. Uh, so once we get back beyond about 30 million years, our records, our direct record, not have direct records, our proxy records, our estimates of CO2 levels get spotty, they get sketchy, um, and there's contradictory evidence. Uh, people look at fossil leaves. And the pores, the stomata on fossil leaves, and the number of those changes as CO2 goes up and down. Fossil leaf evidence suggests that in the Paleocene, CO2 levels are not all that much higher than they are today. Probably 500 ppm or below, which 500 ppm, we're going to be there within uh, probably 30 years or so. Uh, but there's some other evidence from geochemistry, from ocean sediments, uh, that suggests it might have been as high as 800 to 1,000. So higher than today, probably that was part of the reason why the planet system was warmer overall, uh, but exactly how much higher is hard to say. Let's see. Uh, yeah. Well, looking in kind of a microscopic on your uh, baseline of uh, CO2 increases uh, going year to year on that and there. Uh, there was a huge fire season last fall. What percentage did that increase that baseline in the, in the United States there? Yeah. So these kinds of events are embedded in, and people can pick them out of those records. Um, these are the record that we looked at, the Keeling curve that I showed from Mauna Loa at the seasonal cycles. That's, that's 
it's not truly a global record, but it's integrating over a very large area. You're out in the, measuring out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and the CO2 that you're measuring is a pretty much average northern hemisphere signal. So if we have intense fire seasons here in the western US, those could potentially push things a little faster, but often they're counterbalanced by something that's going on somewhere else in the world that might you know, be releasing carbon less slow and, or less quickly. Um, so that said, we do see like into unique events in the record. Uh, ENSO has a big impact on that. They, has a detectable impact on those carbon growth trends, change in carbon, of CO2, um, uh, because it affects ocean circulation in the Pacific and how much ocean and water, water is taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, how much CO2 is being taken out of the ocean water. Um, and so uh, as we go through in the last you know, three or four years, we've had strong in El Nino and strong La Nina years, and the rate of change is detectably different in that curve for those different years. Um, I'm not sure that I can point to the fire season signal in there. Uh, but you know, if you had a more regional record, if we were measuring you know, a site on the east coast of the US, you might be able to pick that out. I'm kind of interested in your recovery time. At PETM, you said it was about 100,000 years. Uh, the two smaller events after the PETM, what kind of recovery time did that have? And then if you go the other way back, potentially all the way to the Permian. Do you have a sense of recovery time? Uh, yeah, so dealing with the more recent stuff first, the Cenozoic stuff. Um, so the, for the PETM, the, the whole event was between about 150 and 200,000 years. And that's maybe 10,000 years of rapid change in CO2 at the beginning. Right? It's this prolonged period of maybe 100,000 years where things don't change that much. And then it's somewhere between 30 and 70,000 years when things do, do recover, and that's what we would expect them to, except they're actually a little faster than we expect them to. Um, if we look at these other events that I mentioned that happened later on in the Eocene, uh, they're smaller, they're kind of more symmetrical. We have, you know, the, the, to the degree that we have the age models where we can parse time at this level, it looks like it takes them. 10 or 20,000 years for the carbon to go into the system, and then it comes out over some similar time scale. Which is interesting because the rock weathering process can't really do that on that time scale. That's too fast for that. So it may actually be that in this case, in these other cases, uh, almost all of the action is inorganic, is inorganic, sorry, is organic carbon. Um, so a release from methane hydrate reservoirs, for example, and then trapping more uh, in sediments. Now, they, those smaller ones, did they float out as much as the ETM? No. Much smaller. Yeah, so the evidence that we have comes from the carbon isotopes. It comes from uh, ocean acidification records. All of that suggests that they were, uh, the, the largest of the other ones were no more than half as large as the So, uh, you know, the ocean system, um, 
There are puzzles there still too. We're trying to better understand the degree of acidification. Um, the models don't get it perfect, but I think we've got a much better handle on at least the physical chemical, physiochemical changes in the ocean. Um, biotic communities change, change somewhat. There's still some uncertainty there, but uh, really a lot of puzzles to my mind are still. So if there are uh, no more questions, we have a, uh, a small token of our appreciation for coming up here. It was such an interesting and data-filled talk. So, uh, Thank you. Yeah, John Everger special. <laughs> and so it's the usual drill with the chairs. These chairs go this way.